Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm the Emeritus Professor of Astronomy at Foothill College, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone here in the Smithwick Auditorium and everyone watching us on YouTube to this, the first talk in the 24th year of the Silicon Valley Astronomy Lectures. Uh, these, this program is co-sponsored co by three organizations which are dedicated to the public understanding of science. Uh, the Foothill College, um, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mass Division. Uh, the SETI, or Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute in Mountain View and the Venerable Astronomical Society of the Pacific, which is devoted to the public understanding of astronomy. And we're very grateful for the support of all of these organizations. Um, so uh, this program uh, is a series of talks uh, that illuminates new developments in astronomy. And we invite astronomers from around the country uh, to come and talk to us about what's happening. Um, tonight's talk is about asteroids, about objects that come near the Earth. And so let me now introduce our speaker, um, the, uh, Dr. Robert Jedeke, uh has had uh, professional careers in particle physics, astronomy, and software engineering, uh, as well as football. He was drafted in 1985 at the top of the third round by the Canadian Football League in British Columbia uh, for the Lions in Vancouver, but was cut early in the tryouts and went on to uh, obtain his PhD in experimental particle physics from the University of Toronto. And we're glad he chose that career. Um, Rob then held postdoctoral positions at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois, and at the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. He then spent more than five years developing image analysis software for instruments uh, at WYKO, Vico Corporation in Tucson, Arizona. At the University of Hawaii's Institute for Astronomy for the last 20 years, he managed the development of the moving object processing systems for the Pan-STARRS telescope on Maui that is one of the world's leading discovery systems for asteroids and comets. And he's going to tell you much more about how that kind of discovery takes place. His current research interests include studying the properties of interstellar objects, objects that come to us from other star systems, and developing plans to extract water from asteroids to provide fuel for future spacecraft missions. So here to discuss the peril and profit of near-Earth objects, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Robert Jeddick. Thank you for that nice introduction, Andrew. It's uh, really nice to be here at Fiddle College. I've heard a lot about it. I also, my, my, my goal in life is to become an Emeritus Professor of Astronomy, so, and, and hopefully that'll be happening soon. So this talk is uh, really two talks. I'm gonna start off talking about the peril of near-Earth objects first. But as you uh, heard in the introduction, I used to play football, and it's an embarrassingly long time since I played football 40 years ago. But uh, you know, you can take the football player off the field, but you can't take the field out of the football player. So I like to start off with a cheer you know, to get me going. I had the cheerleaders to get me going uh, when I was playing football. I need you to help me get this talk going. So I'm gonna yell something out, and then you need to yell something back at me, okay? And there's a, it's a big auditorium, so you need to yell really loud, okay? So, give me an I. I. Okay, louder, this is embarrassing, okay? Give me an M. M. Give me a P. P. Give me an A. A. <laughs> give me a C. C. Give me a T. C. What do you get? <laughs> Impact, yes, thank you. That guy sitting there on the right. 
So I'm sure many of you recognize that clip, although some of you may have been born after it was made. The uh, clip comes from a movie called Deep Impact. And uh, I think it was a really fun movie. The uh, people in this, uh, there's, I know one of my colleagues is in, this, is in the audience as well, and many people in my field were uh, consultants on the movie, including myself. Although I was uh, relatively junior in the field and my name's in the making of the credits. But uh, I, all, my, all of my colleagues thought that was a fantastic movie because it scientifically was pretty accurate. They, you know, they did a really good job of capturing how we actually detect asteroids, what we might do to deflect it, and representing what would actually happen in, in the situation. However, I might get in trouble for this, but I personally recommend uh, Armageddon. It's a much more uh, fun movie to watch. It's completely scientifically, you know, a little off the wall, but uh, my, colleagues, my colleagues hated it, but I loved it better. So, so I, I, I would watch Armageddon over Deep Impact. So uh, one thing that's interesting about the uh, movie is, uh, you know, the Deep Impact and Armageddon came out about the same year, very close in time. And I, I sort of estimated, you know, how much Steven Spielberg probably made off of producing that movie, and I estimated it was something like uh, uh, ten million dollars or so. And Steven Spielberg sent one of his writers out to meet with me. I was at the, working at Kitt Peak, which is an observatory about 60 miles west of Tucson, Arizona. And uh, the writer came up, and he was talking with me for I don't know about six hours. He came up probably around sunset. I think we had dinner, and then we. Uh, I took him to the observatory, I let him move the telescope around, I let him use the software. And for about six hours, I was, you know, telling him everything I knew about asteroids and, and uh, what you would do if you find them, how you find them, what, you know, what do you do if we found one that was going to hit the Earth. And for all of that, Steven Spielberg sent me a check for $100. <laughs> so, if you, if you are thinking about a career in astronomy or movie, predict, movie production, I think you can look at the number of zeros there and decide which way to go. So, <clears throat> can't even read that. Uh, what are asteroids and comets? Let's uh, start off with the basics here. So, um, every time you see a picture of an asteroid, it always looks like, like a potato. Uh, every single asteroid looks like a potato. Uh, some of them are rounder, some of them are more elongated. This is a particular asteroid. It's a relatively small asteroid that was visited by the Japanese space agency spacecraft Hayabusa. And uh, you notice it's got a whole bunch of rocks sticking out of it, some flat areas, uh, no craters on this particular asteroid for uh, very interesting reasons. But this is a picture of a comet. And you know, really, they, they, I think you'd be hard pressed if you didn't know much about it, if you weren't experts to tell the difference between them. Uh, maybe if you look at it carefully, you'd see more sort of jagged cliffs on the comet than on the uh, asteroid. But they're actually quite different in size. I've just sort of you know, compressed the pictures. These are not the scale right now. And if you look really carefully, uh, the sort of upper left there region there, You'll see that there is a, uh, I can't move that. So you'll see that there is a little bit of a jet of gas and dust coming off there. But they actually really had to enhance the image just to bring out the gas and dust. You know, most comets, people think about comets having the big uh, heads and the big tails coming off of them. But uh, it actually is, they're very thin. And you get up close to the asteroid and you can barely see the gas and dust that are coming off the, uh, off the comet. So comets and asteroids really look pretty much the same. And there's really, really fundamentally little difference between them. In fact, you can think of a comet as a dirty ice ball, right? A, a, a comet is, say, mostly ice with a lot of dirt put into it. You can think of a snowball, but you probably don't get a lot of snow here. But you got a snow and you put, mix some dirt in it. So you can think of a comet as a dirty ice ball. And you can think of an asteroid as an icy dirt ball, okay? There is ice inside of a lot of asteroids. And uh, so you think about, you know, mostly dirt, and you pack some ice inside of it, you got an asteroid, right? So there's really different, very, there's very little difference between them. Some asteroids really have very little ice in them. Some comets have a lot of water in them, but it's, they're just on a spectrum. So that's the, that's the difference between them. The third type of small objects we're going to talk about is meteors and meteorites. Meteors are small bits and pieces off of an asteroid or a comet that enter into the Earth's atmosphere. Now, you've probably all seen a shooting star, so that's the technical, uh, and that's the common name for a meteor. So uh, most of the shooting stars that you see, if you're out in a dark place, uh, are actually due to little bits and pieces off asteroids and comets that are about the size of a pea. And they're moving, the, the reason you can see a pea moving across the sky like that is because they enter the atmosphere at about 10 miles per second. That's about 100 times faster than the speed of a high-speed bullet coming out of a rifle. So at 10 miles per second, this tiny little pea that you see burns up due to friction with the Earth's atmosphere. And not only are you seeing something the size of a pea, you're seeing it when it's about 60 miles above you. 
So you're seeing a P 60 miles above you moving at 10 miles per second. That's why they move so fast and they disappear so quickly. What you're seeing here on the screen right now is a very famous meteor called the Peak Skill Meteor. And it took place on a, uh, in 1992, about 30 years ago, over the eastern coast of the United States. And it, uh, on a Friday night, so there were many people out videotaping their sons playing football, and this thing went across the sky, it was brighter than the moon, and everybody looked up and everybody had a video of it. So the many, many people got video of it. This thing, when it hit the Earth's atmosphere, was not the size of a pea. This thing was about the size of a Volkswagen car, so sort of like a, a small car. And it burned up in the atmosphere, it blew off a lot of pieces, and some chunks of it landed on the Earth, and one chunk of it hit this car. This car became, then became worth a lot more money because it was hit by the meteor. Uh, when a chunk of meteor hits the ground, it's then called a meteorite. So this, uh, the car actually got hit by a meteorite, and the car, I think, is now in a museum somewhere. So uh, the other thing I like to try and do when I give a talk is talk about the scale of things. So when you, uh, this is another asteroid. This is an asteroid Ida. And again, it looks kind of like a potato. And uh, Ida is a large asteroid. It's uh, not a particularly dangerous asteroid because it's in, a main, in the main belt of asteroids that we'll talk about. It's quite far from Earth and won't ever come close to Earth. But I like to try and give you an idea of scale. So this is the island of Oahu where I come from. Uh, I live in, uh, uh, does it say there? I live on the, in the, near the Kailua area there on the right-hand side. So Ida and is as big as an island. And that island that I live on is about 40 miles at its, at its, you know, at its longest dimension. So Ida is an asteroid that's about 40 miles in length. It's really, really big. If something like that were to hit the Earth, it would wipe out almost all life on Earth. Fortunately, we know that there's nothing that big that's anywhere close to Earth that's going to hit anytime soon. So where are these objects located? Where are asteroids and comets? So <clears throat> the near-Earth objects are a set of asteroids that can come close to the sun, can come close to the Earth. What you're seeing in this image here is uh, 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 this graphic is a representation of the solar system with the sun represented by the yellow dot at the center. And then uh, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars going outwards, the, the, the green circles, and you see the blue dots moving around. But out beyond the orbit of Mars, you see all those little green dots. And those green dots are the main belt asteroids. There's about a million asteroids out there that are larger than half a mile in diameter. One million larger than half a mile in diameter. But they are all sort of safely between Mars and Jupiter, and very few of them ever get dislodged from their location. They've been out there for about four and a half billion years, and they're not going to cause any problem for the Earth. The asteroids that we call near-Earth objects are the ones that are colored in yellow and red there. And these are objects that may come close to the Earth. We call them near-Earth objects, or NEOs. So NEOs are objects that can approach the sun to within 1.3 astronomical units. And an astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So 1.3 means that any object that comes within 1.3 times the distance of the Earth from the Sun is called a near-Earth object. It does not mean that they actually come close to the Earth. In fact, many of these near-Earth objects do not really come close to Earth at all. We just call them near-Earth objects, and we can argue whether or not it's actually a good name. So 1.3 astronomical units is about 120 million miles. So anything that can come within 120 million miles of the Sun it's called a near-Earth object, and some of those objects can come close to Earth, and some of them can be really dangerous. So, in the past, some asteroids have hit Earth. And, in fact, we can go around the planet and we can identify places on the Earth where there are impact craters, where asteroids or comets have hit the Earth in the past. And uh, it looks like the asteroids and comets really don't like Australia, North America, and Europe, and, you know, favor South America and uh, Africa and Russia. But in fact, that's just a sort of geopolitical and also uh, geological uh, issue because uh, in Africa, in South America, you got the Amazon, you got the Congo Basin. Uh, there's a lot of erosion takes very that takes place very rapidly so that any asteroid that does hit there and creates a crater becomes difficult to find because of all the erosion. Uh, Canada and Australia are great places to find asteroid impacts because they're really old surfaces, and so they preserve the, impact, the record of an impact for a long period of time. Plus, politically, it's easier to get into these regions to actually identify them and do studies to verify that they are truly asteroid impacts. But the most interesting one, maybe the most important one for us in a lot of ways, is this one right here off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. It's now called the Chicxulub impact. And uh, that particular impact occurred about 65 million years ago 
and it was due to the impact of a comet or asteroid that was about six miles in diameter. So just because it's bigger doesn't mean it moves any slower. So you got a six mile diameter chunk of rock and ice that's hitting the Earth at 10 miles per second, faster than a bullet. So you've got a gigantic mountain the size of Mount Everest hitting the Earth at 10 miles per second. And that wiped out something like 90% of all life on the planet. Essentially anything that wasn't underground or in the water, in the ocean, pretty much died. There is good evidence that all the forests on the planet burned, that there were massive earthquakes over the entire planet, that the temperature of the surface of the Earth went up to something like 450 degrees Fahrenheit over the entire surface of the Earth due to this impact, which, is what, which explains why everything died. I like this particular simulation here. It'll keep repeating many times. But uh, in this particular simulation, uh, this is, this is a, a, a calculation that was done that, of what happened to the Earth's surface when this six-mile diameter object hit the Earth's surface. It creates a gigantic depression, a crater, that then the Earth actually sort of rebounds up and then it falls back down and it forms a sort of a double crater impression. These are called concentric craters. And concentric crater systems are typical for very large asteroid and comet impacts. And I always think of, the, when I look at this, I think of you know, what happens when you, the last drop of milk out of the carton drops into the surface of your glass and it sort of pops up and you see these waves going out of it. That's kind of what happened to the surface of the Earth. But remember, this is the surface of the Earth. This is ground we're talking about. We're not talking about a liquid like milk. But the surface of the Earth acts like a liquid when it's hit with so much energy, when you've got something six miles in diameter hitting at 10 miles per second. It liquefies the ground, essentially, and it acts like a liquid. But if that hasn't already blown your mind, uh, I would want to give you an idea of the scale of the time frame for this is happening. This whole process here happens in about five or 10 minutes. A mountain gets created in five minutes and collapses in five minutes. And that mountain, you can't see it there, is uh, as big as, is three times higher than Mount Everest. So this mountain that got, that got kicked up off of the surface of the Earth is three times higher than Mount Everest. It create, was created in about five minutes and it collapsed back down in the next five minutes. So there is no doubt about it, an asteroid killed the dinosaurs, right? There used to be, 30 years ago, I remember be, uh, listening to a lecture where uh, Walter Alvarez, who really came up with this idea, or, or found the evidence to support it, he was, he was giving a lecture at the University of Chicago, and at the time when he gave the lecture, it was still kind of controversial whether or not an asteroid killed the dinosaurs or not. There were other people who thought it was volcanism or other factors, but it's now, I think, quite clear there's a, a tremendous amount of evidence to support the idea that it was the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. And that's good for us, because when it killed all the, most of the life on the planet, the rodents that survived, the little mammals that survived that were scurrying underground, those are the rodents, the animals that eventually evolved into us human beings. So we have the asteroid impact 65 million years ago to thank for us being here. So how do we reduce the impact risk? Uh, what we do is we build telescope systems, and we've gotten better and better at doing this. I've been doing this for about 30 years, and uh, every, every few years there's some new improvement, some new technology that comes along that allows us to be m more and more efficient at detecting these asteroids. I went to Hawaii 20 years ago to build this system called Pan Stars, which is on the summit of Haleakala on Maui, and it is now sort of neck and neck for being one of the world's leading discovery systems for near-Earth objects, along with a system that's in Tucson, Arizona, in the mountains north of Tucson. But in a few years, there's going to be a system that's being built right now. It's uh, nearing the final stages of completion. In just a couple of years, it's called the Vera Rubin Observatory. It's in Chile. And this, this system is uh, absolutely incredible. It's, uh, if you know the specifications for it, it just it blows my mind uh, what, it's, what kind of capabilities it's going to have. And it's going to be able to find 10 times more asteroids than we currently know. So it's going to be able to, what we do, uh, complete the inventory of the system, a uh, solar system. That's one of their goals. And it will find uh, 10 times more near-Earth objects than we currently know and find them much more rapidly. So this is an uh, amazing system. It's going to start operations in about two years, maybe three years. But it's, it's being built as we speak right now. So <clears throat> how do we actually find the asteroids? Well, it's a fun job. <laughs> Uh, it's been now ro roboticized, made a lot more computerized. It used to be people sitting at a telescope and actually looking at images and, and uh, looking at photographic films, which some of you might remember. But nowadays what we do typically is we take an image of the sky, say at uh, midnight. This is actually some images that I took many, many years ago. And uh, you know, we come back and we come back, uh, say 30 minutes later, we take another image of exactly the same region of the sky 
And then another 30 minutes later, we come back to take another image of exactly the same, same uh, place in the sky. Now, of course, many of you recognize that there's a galaxy there in the center. And what we do is we superposition those three images on top of one another, effectively. And so the thing that you see there in the middle is a galaxy, and then the, most of the dots that you see around it are stars. And then what we do is we do something called blinking. We rapidly go between those three images, and we look for something that moves, because stars and galaxies are really far away. They do not move in the sky relative to one another. But the asteroids are in our own solar system. So the asteroids move around the sun, and we're moving around the sun, so the apparent position of an asteroid against the background of stars and galaxies changes with time. So we blink through these images, and if you look carefully, I'll give you just a few uh, seconds to check it out, but you're looking for something that looks like a star that's actually moving in a line across three different images. And if you found the two of them, they're right there, those are the two asteroids that are in this particular image. So nowadays, we have computer software that does this for us automatically, I don't have to stand there and you know, blink between the images. They used to do this, uh, and I, some people still do it when you're looking for a very difficult object to identify. The software finds these objects automatically, measures their positions, and we report them to uh, International Clearinghouse for Asteroid Observations. So, what do we do if we find one? Well, what we want to do is we, we want to deflect it. So, we don't want to blow it up, because the idea is if you blow it up, then you create a whole bunch of buckshot that hits the Earth. So instead of a bullet hitting the Earth, you've got a bunch of buckshot hitting the Earth. And either way, it's not good for the Earth. So let's say you've got an asteroid, we found this got our name on it. It's got a tar it's got, the Earth's got a target on it for this particular asteroid. We want to deflect it. But let's say we deflect it, and we don't know what we're doing, and we deflect it so that instead of hitting the uh, United States, it hits Russia. You know, that would be really bad. So when we deflect an asteroid, we have to ensure that we do it properly, that we can actually deflect it entirely off the surface of the Earth so that there's no danger at all of anywhere on the surface being hit. So we want to be really careful. We want to be able to ensure that we know that we can actually remove the impact risk of a particular asteroid. So how do we test deflection? We want to be able to show that we can actually do this. It's not something that you want to do at the last minute. It's not like we want to see, we want to find an asteroid that's going to hit in 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and then just go practice on it, right? We want to actually be sure that we can do this. So uh, NASA has uh, created this mission called the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Uh, they call it DART. And DART was a spacecraft that slammed into an asteroid, and it changed its orbit around another asteroid. So there's a... So many asteroids are actually called what we call binary asteroids. There are two asteroids that go around each other, revolve around each other. In this particular case, the larger one is called Didymos, and the smaller one that orbits around Didymos is called Dimorphos. And the idea here is that if you slam, in, if you slam a spacecraft into an asteroid, you will change its orbit. That will happen. But measuring the change in the orbit is difficult from the Earth. It's, it's difficult to measure how much you change the orbit of an asteroid around the sun. In this particular case, this is a relatively small asteroid, Dimorphos. Dimorphos is only about the size, and I like football field using football reference. Dimorphos is only maybe two football fields in length, in size. So it's a relatively small asteroid, 160 yards or so across. And instead of measuring its, the change in its orbit around the sun, we measure the change in its orbit around Didymos. So it's orbiting the Didymos, and we slam into Dimorphos, and we try and change Dimorphos' orbit. And in this particular case, I, 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 right now I'm forgetting what the orbital period of Dimorphos is around Didymos. I think it's something like 12 hours. And we wanted to change its orbit, the period of its revolution around Didymos, only by 10 minutes. That was the goal, to so try and change the orbit of Dimorphos around Didymos by only 10 minutes. So I'm going to show a video here. This is all animation. This is not uh, a real video taken by any spacecraft. But, uh, so the spacecraft passes by, the DART spacecraft passes by Didymos, and it slams into Dimorphos. And this gives you an idea of the scale of the spacecraft relative to the asteroid that it slammed into. Now, the spacecraft is something like a large washing machine. It's got these big solar panels that come off of it. But it's, you've got this tiny little thing slamming into this 160-yard diameter asteroid at about four miles per second. And what did that actually do? One thing I want to point out right now is this, this cone here. It's like 45 degrees. And this is, uh, this is all, like I said, simulation. But I want you to compare it to a video that I'm going to show a little bit later. 
This is actual video of the impact taken from the spacecraft that, sl that slammed into Dimorphos. So what you see there on the left, the big object is the asteroid Didymos, and the little object on the right is Dimorphos. So the spacecraft is gonna come flying in, this is real video from the spacecraft. Now it's, uh, it's I think it's at about 10 times normal speed until the last six images just before it slams into uh, Dimorphos. So you'll see what actually happens here. So we're flying by, we're flying towards the system right now, and this is like 10 times speed. We're gonna pass by the larger asteroid. You can see craters on the surface of the larger asteroid. The craters there are due to impacts of other asteroids on that asteroid. So now we've passed by the large asteroid. We're approaching Dimorphos. You can see a lot of detail on it already. We're getting really close to it. And now these last few images are taken in, in real time. And you can see that the surface is like a rubble pile. In fact, that's what we call all these asteroids right now. We call them rubble piles. Because all these asteroids have been slammed in the past and they all sort of disperse and then they reaccumulate re into rubble piles. They're just piles of rock that are held together by some friction and, and, and gravity. And the reason you might think this is sort of a glitch in the video, this is, a, it is a big glitch in the video because this is the last image it got before it slammed into the, as, into the asteroid. So it only managed to capture that little bit of the image at the top and the rest of it's blank because it, that's when it slammed into the asteroid. So the uh, European Space Agency had a spacecraft, a, a little what they call CubeSat that was following behind the DART spacecraft, and it imaged what was happening after the DART spacecraft slammed into Dimorphos. So I'm gonna show you, that's the big, the big object there is the asteroid Didymos. The smaller, fainter one there is the Dimorphos object. So the, this Lycia cube from the European Space Agency was flying by them, watching what happened, and you can see the, actually the impact plume off of the secondary asteroids below the field of the UV there, and then all of a sudden the Lycia cube goes by and is looking backwards now at the, at the impact, and you can see the, uh, the impact plume coming off the, off the asteroid. And the thing I like to point out here is that there was a simulation that showed that cone of material coming off of Dimorphos, and you can see the sort of same plume there. So, so the simulation was kind of accurate in the shape of the plume that came off of this asteroid. We also have images of the impact taken from Earth. Now from Earth, you can't separate the two asteroids, the Dimorphos and Dimorphos system, because they're too close together on the sky. Uh, the impact took place about uh, 11 million miles from Earth. No, seven, seven million miles, from, I'm thinking in kilometers. Seven million miles from Earth. And what you see here in the center, or what you see on the edge sides there are these, uh, the dots that are stars. And the thing in the center there is both asteroids, Didymos and Dimorphos put together. And uh, what's gonna happen is the telescope is tracking on the asteroid. So the asteroid won't move as it's being hit, but the stars will move behind it because we're tracking on, on the asteroids. So let's see what happens here. And you can see what happens. The asteroid gets slammed and there's this massive plume of material that comes off, and the plume expands off of the asteroid, and we can actually watch this happen from Earth. The brightness of the asteroid incre in increased uh, uh, dramatically when this impact took place. This, these images, this movie was taken by the Atlas telescope that's based on, in uh, Hawaii as well. So, in a few years, the European Space Agency is going to send another spacecraft to the same asteroid because we want to see what happened. Remember, one of the spacecraft slammed into Dimorphos, and the other spacecraft flew by it really quickly to get an idea what was happening. But we don't really know what happened, what, what the final shape of the asteroid is. And that we have some evidence now from ground-based observations that, we, that this impact dramatically changed the shape of the asteroid that it slammed into. The shape of the asteroid changed. Even though it's just a tiny little spacecraft slamming into this gigantic asteroid, we actually changed the shape of the asteroid. And the amount of uh, uh, momentum that we transferred was much larger than anticipated or than, 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 than the minimum requirement. They wanted to change the orbital period by 10 minutes, and they managed to change the orbital period by 30 minutes. So, so the impact of the, uh, of the spacecraft into the asteroid changed it by three times more than was expected. And that's due to the fact that when, we, when it slammed into the asteroid, it blew off a bunch of material. And all the material that blew off gave the asteroid an extra kick. In fact, it gave the asteroid two times more kick than the impact of the spacecraft itself. And that's a, that's a really important factor if you want to try and deflect an asteroid. You want to be able to deflect it and you want to take advantage of that kick that you get from blowing off material. So the Hera spacecraft will visit the same 
asteroid system in a few years to measure what actually happened to the system so we can do much better predictions of how to deflect asteroids in the future. So why do we do all these things? Why do we have uh, Pan Stars, the Vera Rubin Observatory, DART, and HERA? Well, we do it to save the planet from destruction, right? And I think it's a, it's a valuable uh, process. It's a valuable experiment. We are a lot smarter than dinosaurs. And I think that we can save the planet from destruction. We can save the planet from losing 90% of the species like happened when the Cheeks Lube impact happened 65 million years ago. So that's the uh, first half of the talk. And uh, we're going to switch over to talking about the profit of near-Earth objects. I've talked about the peril and what we've done about it. And we're trying to reduce the hazard. And so I'm going to talk about the profit of near-Earth objects. And so I feel like I need to change my shirt. I was going to rip it off like Superman or something like this. But uh, my wife would kill me, and I don't know how to sew buttons back on. So um, I'm, this is, I'm wearing my Trans Astra Asteroid Mining shirt now. And uh, I, I do work with this company called Trans Astra, uh, which is an, a real, a real honest-to-goodness asteroid mining company. The, uh, Asteroid mining, uh, we hope to make a reality uh, sooner than later. I won't give you an exact year when it's going to happen. <laughs> um, because we think that it's a trillion dollar industry for the 21st century. We think that there's a, a lot of money involved that, that can be, uh, that can, a lot of, uh, an economy, a gigantic economy that can be created in space using asteroid resources. So, uh, and one of the reasons that we can do that is because the United States, uh, about, I think it was seven years ago or so, passed something called the U.S. Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act. And it's, uh, it's, it's really astounding that the United States passed this. It was under the Obama administration. And what it does is it doesn't give any person, country, or organization the right to own an asteroid. You can't go plant a flag or your company logo on an asteroid and say, this is ours. But it does give you the right that if you go to an asteroid or comet or somewhere and you extract the material from it, the material that you extract becomes yours. That is your resource to sell to anybody who's willing to buy. <laughs> and uh, this, uh, this has been called the most sweeping legislative recognition of property rights in human history. It's a pretty uh, astounding uh, piece of legislation that could, we hope, open up space for, uh, for, for uh, open up the space economy. So, when I was a kid, and maybe even on TV nowadays, if you watch things like The Expanse, you see some things that look like this. You see massive mining operations on asteroids. And I certainly hope that something like this does happen, but it's certainly not going to be the first thing that happens in space around an asteroid. And in fact, I, I myself was kind of dubious about how fast we would be mining asteroids or how soon we'd be mining asteroids until I went to hear a lecture by the CEO of this company, Trans Astra. And uh, I think everybody in the audience was very uh, dubious of, of, what, of uh, the whole concept of asteroid mining. But I think he gave a really compelling argument for how we could turn asteroids into resources. The idea is, and the idea was sort of inspired by a combination of many things, but it was um, motivated in part by uh, an offer made by this company. It's called United Launch Alliance. For all I know, somebody here may actually work for United Launch Alliance. But this is a, a real company. You may not have heard about it, but it's a billion dollar company. It's got thousands of employees. They've had hundreds of successful launches for governments and private organizations. And uh, they were at this conference that I attended about asteroid mining. And uh, they made this offer to pay $10,000 per liter of water. The catch is that that liter of water had to be in high Earth orbit, right? They're not going to give you $10,000 for a liter of water, you know, that you got from Safeway. You have to get that liter of water into high Earth orbit, and then they'll give you $10,000. And why? Because it would cost them $20,000 to launch that liter of water to that high Earth orbit location. So if you can, they can buy it from you at $10,000 per liter, they're saving some money. And so why is water so important? Well, water can be used for fuel. You can separate water, H2O, into its components, hydrogen and oxygen. And hydrogen and oxygen are like two of the, be the two best, uh, sort of, uh, the, the best fuel for rocket engines that there is possible. But you can also use the, the water directly as steam. And the company Transaster is building steam rocket engines. And I think that's just fascinating to think that steam engines, you know, 
opened up the industrial era, you know, st you know, steam locomotives. And now we're actually talking about having steam engines in space. So water is valuable as a fuel. It's valuable as radiation shielding. Water is a really good radiation shield. It's also easy to mold. All you gotta do is turn it into water, you know, from ice into water, and then you can pump it into any enclosure that you want. And once it solidifies, it becomes, well, even before it solidifies, it becomes just a great radiation shield that you can easily shape any way that you want. Of course, you need it for human consumption and agriculture. And the fourth really important point is that it's straightforward to mine. I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna do that very soon. So, when, when I was a kid, I don't think it was absolutely clear, but as time has gone on over the past five or so or more decades, it's become clear that water is everywhere. Water is everywhere in our sources. And everywhere we look, there's water. Of course, we know that there's water on Earth. We know that there's water at the poles of Mars. We know that there's water in the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We know that the rings of Saturn are mostly ice, water ice. And uh, so, so water is absolutely everywhere. But we also know that there's water on the moon. There are, there's water on the south pole of the moon is shown on the left, the north pole of the moon is shown on the right. And the blue regions there show where we have identified water. And if you look, the dark, the, the amount, the, the coloring there is an is, is indication of how much sunlight each of the regions gets. So what you'll see is a high correlation between where there's a lot of dark areas, because it doesn't get a lot of sunlight, and where the blue areas are where we identified water. So both the north and south poles of the moon, we have identified water. So there's water in the moon, on the moon. Now, why is there water in the moon? This is a beautiful animation of the rotation of the moon. And you can see that the moon rotates uh, kind of vertically. The Earth, you might know, is tilted at about a 23 and a half degree angle. It's called the obliquity of the, the tilt of the Earth's orbit. But the moon's orbit is not tilted. It's only tilted about one and a half degree. And so any craters that the north and south pole of the moon, the craters are deep. And so the deep craters, inside the bowl of the craters, they do not get a lot of light. In fact, there are craters on the surface uh, at the poles of the moon that have not seen sunlight for billions of years. In particular, there's a crater called Shackleton Crater, which is at one of the poles, that is about uh, 21 kilometers in diameter. And to give you an idea of scale, that means that the, the area of San Jose, I looked this up, the area of San Jose is about the same area as the area of that crater. Right? So you could fit all of San Jose into that crater. And the crater is, you can't see it, four kilometers deep, which is twice as deep as the Grand Canyon. So it's twice as deep as the Grand Canyon, the size of San Jose. And the bottom of this crater is in a permanently shadowed region. This is an animation of uh, images taken of Shackleton Crater and this is a real image taken over a, a, a lunar day. And you can see that the interior of the crater is permanently shadowed. And there are edge, parts of the edge of the crater that have seen sunlight. And, but, the, but the interior of the crater has not seen light for more than a billion years. And the interior of the crater is at a temperature of minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And what happens is any water molecules that are on the surface of the moon there, you know, most of the surface of the moon is too hot so that the water molecules are sort of bouncing around all over the place. But eventually they find their way and they bounce up into, into the polar regions. And once they bounce into one of these craters, it's so cold that they just stick there. It's like sticking your tongue to you know, a cold fence. The, uh, the, the water molecules just stick there. So over billions of years, these permanently shadowed regions in these craters at the poles of the moon have collected water. So we know that there's water on the moon. We also know that there's lots of water in asteroids. I was telling you that asteroids are icy dirt balls. So this is the largest asteroid in the main belt. It's about 600 miles in diameter. And the very first images of, it, of, of this asteroid taken up close and personal by the Dawn spacecraft from NASA showed this like, uh, Death Star-like image, right? You got this bright spot there. It really looked like the Death Star. It turns out that what that bright spot is, is it's salts on the surface. And the salts have uh, come up from the interior of C Ceres where there's a lot of water. And though it's very salty water, it's not the kind of salt that we have on the Earth. It's not sodium chloride salt. It's, uh, I think it's magnesium sulfate uh, salts. 
but it's got different kinds of salts, salty water inside, and every once in a while in this particular location, the salty water bubbles up from the interior surface, gets to the surface of series, uh, gets to the surface of series, and then the water called sublimates away and leaves these salt deposits there. And of course, the salt is very bright, just like salt on, on the earth. So it turns out that the best estimates right now suggest that Ceres is 25% water by mass. 25% water, one quarter of it is water. And if that's true, if that result turns out to be true, it means there's more water on Ceres than there is on Earth, in Earth's oceans. So there's a lot of water in Ceres. And of course we know, as I described earlier, that asteroids and comets have got ice in them. It'd be really great to mine a comet for water, ice, because they have more water ice than asteroids do, but we can still extract water from asteroids, right? So we've got multiple locations in our solar system to get water from. We know there's lots of water on Earth, but it's hard to get the water off of Earth into space. We know that there's water at the poles of the moon, but on the moon, you gotta deal with permanently shadowed regions. If it's permanently shadowed, that means that you've gotta work at minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. The moon, surface of the moon is also covered with really, really fine dust that gets into everything. And there's also asteroids and comets. So, which of these is the best place to extract water? And I think I would like to argue right now that asteroids are the best place. But not all asteroids are equal, kind of like in real estate. It's all about location, location, location. So, we talked about NEOs already, and uh, that there's all these asteroids that come in close to the solar system. So, we don't want to go all the way out to the main belt of asteroids. They're quite far away. We don't want to have to spend all the time to get out there. But there's these other NEOs that come in closer to the sun, but not all these NEOs are the same either. Uh, it turns out there's one 10 meter diameter asteroid closer than the moon at all times. So right now, as we speak, there is an asteroid the size of a house that is closer to us than the moon. So you think, well, why not just go there and get that asteroid and, and mine it for water? Well, I'll get to that because, like I said, not all asteroids are equal. You also have to worry about something called delta V. Now, delta V is the change in speed that's required to get somewhere. So this, you've probably seen this many times on TV or on, on, online. Uh, to, uh, delta V is the, is, the, is the amount of energy, the change in speed that you need to get from, say, the surface of the Earth into low Earth orbit, or the uh, change in speed that you need to get from low Earth orbit to the moon. So delta V is really important. And you, the higher the delta V, the higher the change in speed, the more energy you need in order to achieve that delta V. So, you want to have as small a delta V as possible in order to have, to, to use as little energy as possible, because the more energy you use, the more money it costs, and that makes the whole process of mining asteroids less profitable. So, it turns out that there's a low delta V zone of asteroids that is sort of like this donut, this torus around the Earth's orbit, so it's centered on the Earth's orbit. So, uh, it's about 20, think of about a, a donut that's got a diameter, not, not the diameter of the whole donut, but the diameter of the, of the, the donut, the, the donut part itself, the dough part itself, is about 20 million miles. Right? So asteroids that constantly are in that range of distance from the Earth are in the low delta V zone. So we think that those asteroids there have got a low enough delta V that they take a small enough amount of energy that we can get there, mine them, and get back, and still do it profitably. We also have to worry about an asteroid's size. It's kind of like Goldilocks. The diameter of the asteroid really matters. If the asteroid is too small, less than, say, five meters in diameter, say the size of a good-sized car, there's not going to be enough water inside of the asteroid to make it profitable. It's just, you know, we can go there, we can mine the asteroid, we can extract the water from it, but once we get the water, we, it's just going to cost us more to go there and extract it than it's going to make us money when we bring it back to the Earth-Moon system. Similarly, asteroids that are too big, right now we don't know how to deal with. So if, there, if you've got an asteroid that's bigger than this auditorium, it's too hard for us to deal with. We don't know yet, we don't have the technology or the ideas to extract the water from asteroids that large. So there's kind of a sweet spot for us between 5 and 30 meters in diameter. We think that those asteroids are both manageable enough in terms of size, diameter, so that we can mine them, and profitable enough in terms of their water content that we can actually make some money. So, to give you an idea of scale, 20 meters in diameter is about the size of sort of like a, you know, a normal house. And so that would be, think of an asteroid, a chunk of rock, a potato, that is, you know, as big as a house. And we think asteroids that size we can actually deal with. 
The final thing we need to worry about is something called taxonomy. So taxonomy is, uh, uh, is basically means the mineralogy. What is the material that's inside the asteroid? And what we want to do is we want to try and find the iciest dirt ball that we can. And we know that asteroids contain material, uh, contain water, so we can put it all together. We can, put, we can uh, put all these different concepts I've just been talking about together. And the concept is that you basically take an asteroid and you heat it up and you can get the water out of it. And how do we know this? Because as I said at the very beginning of the talk, a meteorite is a piece of an asteroid or comet that came through the Earth's atmosphere and landed on Earth. So we've got chunks, we've got samples of asteroids and comets in meteorites on the surface of the Earth. We can take them, we can grind them up, put them in a test tube, put them on a Bunsen burner, and water comes out. The stuff that you see at the top of this, Bunsen, uh, uh, the, of this test tube right here is water that came out of the meteorite, that came out of an asteroid. So we know we can do, we, can, we know we can extract water from asteroids just by heating them up. And we've tested this. When I, when I say we, I, got, I should clarify that uh, it's, it's the whole community of, of people in, that I work with, not, not me, <laughs> not me necessarily. So what they did is they took uh, uh, an asteroid simulant and they placed it at the focus of this gigantic solar furnace in New Mexico and they uh, put this rock, which is, it's, a, it's, an earth, it's an earth rock that's kind of similar, uh, very similar to uh, the kind of rocks that you find on asteroids, and they put it at the focus of this solar furnace. And the solar furnace gets to a tremendous thousands of degrees Fahrenheit. And what happens is that the water, the water molecules inside the rock get heated up so hot that they blow off material from the surface of the rock. And as the material that get, gets blown off blows away, it frees up more fresh surface with more water. And so you dig a hole into this rock using the solar furnace. So this is exactly the idea that we have for mining asteroids. We want to take an asteroid, put it into a bag, use gigantic inflatable solar reflectors to collect light, and then focus that light down onto the surface of the asteroid. Water molecules come out of the surface of the asteroid, and they get collected, they bounce around inside the bag, and they eventually find their way up into these cold traps, these, these big balls that you see on the top. And these cold traps are kept in out of direct sunlight, so they're very cold, and just like in the permanently shadowed regions of the moon, the water molecules freeze there, and then we bring that material back to Earth, or back to the Earth-Moon system. Now, you're probably thinking this all looks crazy, but in fact, 30 years ago, NASA flew and in 12, 14 meter diameter inflatable reflector. So this is, this is not CGI, this is not made up, this is not artist conception. This is a real inflatable 14 meter diameter reflector. So this is a proven technology and things have improved in the last 30 years as well. So we think this is something that can be done. Uh, we have at, uh, at, at the Transaster headquarters, they have these, uh, infla they've got mock inflatable systems, uh, mirrors that they're building in the laboratory, and they've got this sort of laser testing system here to verify that they can inflate the mirrors and get that to focus properly on the surface of the asteroid. And NASA never flew this uh, bag of an, bagging an asteroid mission, but they, did, they spent a lot of time developing the whole concept. So NASA has got well-developed plans to uh, create a spacecraft that can go bag an asteroid and move it around. So this also is technology that's not been flown, it's not been in space, but it's uh, well-researched technology that's been designed on the ground and they've built similar systems. In fact, Transastra has uh, built a system that uh, can grab an asteroid. Now this is a system here that uses only air pressure to inflate. So all the things that you're seeing inflating here, almost everything you're seeing here, is inflating just with air pressure. You pump air into it and the uh, inflate, and the, and the asteroid capture bag inflates, and then we drop a synthetic uh, a mock asteroid into the bag, and then we have a robotic zipper that closes the bag up. It's a bag, so you don't have to pull it across. It's a, it's a self-propelled zipper that bags the, uh, the asteroid itself. And then once the asteroid is bagged and hermetically sealed inside of the zip, inside with, with the zipper, we, again, using just air pressure, manipulate the arms to try and bring that asteroid closer to the spacecraft so it gets close to where the focus of the sunlight is so we can heat it up and extract uh, water molecules. So 
Before we can go mine an asteroid, you have to find the asteroids. So we have uh, a number of systems that, we're, that we've already built. There's uh, the Sutter system. By the way, Sutter is named after the uh, Sutter Mill, Sutter, Sutter, Sutter Mill, that I think was the mill that, where they found gold that started the California Gold Rush. So uh, we want to start a water rush in space, and so we're, we've named the, uh, the systems, the survey systems, Sutter. So we use uh, these telescope systems in, uh, in California to find asteroids. We've got a similar system in Tucson, outside of Tucson, Arizona. So we want to, these systems are designed to try and find specifically these low delta V asteroids that we can actually mine. It's not designed to find the dangerous asteroids that uh, can destroy life on the planet. It's designed specifically to find the small asteroids that are moving fast, that are close to Earth, so that we can mine them. Of course, we have bigger dreams. We want to develop a system that we can put in space, and uh, we have, you know, some people would call crazy ideas, ambitious ideas about uh, launching these systems into space and serving for the asteroids up there because then you don't have to worry about weather, you don't have to worry about uh, daytime, and uh, you um, can operate continuously. So the idea that we have here for these spacecraft is, what, what I show in the middle there, you see the little blue, the dot on the blue circle, the blue arc, that's the Earth, and you can see the little dot going around, and that's the moon. And then you see these three spacecraft that appear to be going around the Earth. But in fact, they're not gravitationally bound for, to the Earth. They're too far from Earth to actually be bound to the Earth-Moon system. Instead, those three spacecraft are going around the Sun. But they're going around the Sun on orbits that have been specifically selected to make it look like they are going around the Earth. And it's really hard to see in this lighting, but there are the little red dots there. And the little red dots, each one represents a, a synthetic or a simulated asteroid that's one of these low delta asteroids that we're talking about. So the, so the three spacecraft are circulating inside the donut of the low delta V asteroids. So it's sort of immersed in the dough of the donut looking for the asteroids that we can actually mine. So one of the reasons that I was asked to, be, uh, to work with transasteroids because I, I can do these calculations to figure out how many asteroids there are that are of low delta V of the correct size and what fractional water they contain. And when you do all the calculations, you work it all out, it turns out that there's about 100,000 tons of water that's out there in these low delta V asteroids that we could mine. And 100,000 tons of water at the price that ULA was willing to pay us is worth about a trillion dollars. So one trillion dollars of asteroids. So, to bring this to a close, a uh, question that I've pondered throughout my career is whether or not we should perish due to asteroids, and I'm doing my best, and my colleagues have uh, done their best to try and find, and are continuing to do their best, to try to find the dangerous asteroids before the dangerous asteroids find us, or to profit from asteroids. Uh, that is my question. And I think that, uh, I chose to go this way, <laughs> and uh, I think that you know, what you can take away from this is you, know, you may have heard a lecture by the first billionaire astronomer <laughs> who made his money, <laughs> people are laughing, <laughs> first billionaire astronomer, that's my goal, to become the first billionaire astronomer. Thank you very much. <laughs> I will start with the moderator's privilege by asking, what sort of time scale is the company thinking about for actually doing the beginnings of, of this work? Do you have any kind of a time scale in mind? Uh, we'd like to do it next year, but the uh, problem is getting the money to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, uh, that that's the problem. I think that I, I have a lot of confidence that te technology is there. It's just a, mat a matter of trying to find the, the money to do this, this thing. And, uh, you know, realistically, I, I can't possibly say. You know, it's difficult, impossible to predict these kind of things. Well, let's go right. To All that. right. Thank you. So, um, is my question has two parts. One is, what happens to the asteroid after the fact? And the reason I'm asking that because by extracting water, I assume that the speed of that asteroid changes. So that means that's perhaps a new chance or new risk for hitting or um, basically alternating with the speed. So those are my two questions. Okay, so I, that, that's a common question I get, uh, thank you. And I, I think that when, when we, 
when we extract the water from the asteroid, it, it will become, uh, remember, most asteroids are, are rubble piles already. They're just piles of rock that are held together by friction and gravity. So we're just sort of really uh, taking a rubble pile, extracting the water from it, and then leaving a rubble pile or a dust pile. And then we take the bag off, and we just let that dust pile keep going. And it may, might disperse, or it might not. But the thing to remember is that the mass of the Earth increases by 100,000 tons per year due to the impact of meteors and meteorites. And the mass that, and, and these asteroids that we're mining, they're not currently going to be on an impact orbit with the Earth. And they may evolve with time into an impact orbit with the Earth. But the Earth is already being hit by 100,000 tons per year. And so I think that the amount of uh, additional danger or, or meteors that we create due to mining asteroids is really small. Thank you. So first off, thanks. That was a great talk. Um, my question, um, you know, the cliche that most people have is you're going to go get these heavy metals off metallic asteroids. And I have my own theories about, about why this is more practical, but I'm interested in hearing yours. Well, I, I'm not a geologist. I'm an astronomer, <laughs> well, an astronomer, physicist. And uh, so I, I don't know a lot about this, but I can only, I can repeat what I've heard. And what I've heard is that, yeah, asteroids contain a lot of these uh, plat platinum group metals that are valuable metals. That are, but they, you know, on the Earth, the valuable metals, gold, silver, they tend to come together. There's veins of gold and silver that come up. And so you can mine a vein of silver or gold and you can go down. So it's concentrated because the Earth has been heated up and metals that are similar tend to get, go together. And so they basically create these veins so they're easy to mine. Well, that kind of heating and that kind of process hasn't happened on most asteroids. And if, even if it did, the asteroids didn't get slammed and they disperse and they reaccumulate in the rubble pile. So, so I think that the metals are more, more evenly distributed throughout an asteroid. So to process the asteroid for these precious metals is a complicated thing where you have to process the entire asteroid, uh, in, in, you know, lots of volume in order to get to the metals. You can't just sort of go and find a, a rock that's gold on an asteroid or, or a platinum rock. You know, it, it requires a lot more work and a lot more energy. Thank you. Yeah, aside from uh, water, uh, do we have much information yet about what kinds of other minerals might be there that are worth mining? Yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole group. People write PhD theses, they write papers on these things, and, and people argue about this at conferences all the time. And it, it all depends on, uh, you know, what's profitable depends on how, what, what goes into your model. So there's certainly these, platinum group metals, there's gold, there's silver, there's all sorts of valuable things on, these a on the asteroids. But uh, it's a matter of, you know, where are those asteroids located? How can you extract the materials? How can you get them back to a customer that actually wants them, right? So there's lots of stuff out there, but it's just difficult to come up with a profitable model. We think that water is the first material out there in an asteroid that we can actually make a, uh, mine as a profitable resource. Um, hi, I, I was just, I'm really curious about what spectra are used to detect these asteroids. Um, I assume it's visible because you're looking at like reflections of sunlight, but uh, I guess more importantly, I'm curious how you survey the material of the asteroid itself, if it's from off-gassing or, or something like that. Right. So you're asking what kind of uh, other information can we find out about the asteroid before we go to it to try and increase the probability that it's got water in it. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I used the word taxonomy early on, earlier. And taxonomy is, the, there's, there's broad classes of asteroids. And, you know, unimaginatively it's S and C, basically silicate and carbonaceous, and then there's a few other types. And even within the S and the C classes, there are subclasses, subtypes within it. And each one of those different classes and types has got a different kind of a spectra, spectrum. And so if we can obtain spectra of the asteroids before we go there, and we certainly would try, we would 
be able to identify whether or not the asteroid is of the kind of asteroid or spectra that has a higher probability of containing the water that we want. And I like to try and make a parallel here with oil, oil expeditions, oil, oil mining expeditions, ships that go out into uh, the ocean and they drop you know, these pipes that go down, astounding, they go down through miles of water and then miles into the crust and they can even go you know, at different angles, right? And you know, they, they don't always hit correctly. They do the best they can. They do their uh, investigations. They have all sorts of, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know the technologies that they use, but they have ways of trying to increase the probability that where they're drilling is gonna have a higher probability of having oil. But they still, as I understand it, most of the times they drill, they come up dry. Now, we don't want to do that with our water uh, from asteroids mission, so we would you know, do the best we can trying to get the spectra, identify the spectra as an asteroid that is of a type that has a high probability get, of, of having water, and then going to those asteroids. Thank you. But that, I also want to point out that that's kind of almost like the last step, though. You have to find the asteroids first, right? You have to get their orbits, make sure that they're the low delta V orbits, and then once you've found those asteroids, then you need to get their spectra. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, based on your mining techniques, you're using heat to remove debris to get to a further layer of ice. Would you be able to create a machine that's uh, heat is strong enough to remove the debris and thus changing the impact of the asteroid to avoid the to perish scenario? Huh. Yeah, so combining the two parts of the, of the talk. So I only talked about one method for deflecting an asteroid that was impacting the asteroid with something, a spacecraft is the most massive spacecraft you can slam into it is the, you know, the more massive it is, the better the deflection is gonna be. But there's a, a number of different ideas of how to deflect asteroids. And one of the ideas is exactly what you suggest, to have gigantic mirrors that you use to focus sunlight on the asteroid, to blow material off of it, either rock or, or, or rock that comes off because you've heated up the water or other uh, volatile materials inside that blow off. But yes, uh, heating them up in a controlled fashion with mirrors that are positioned around the asteroid is an idea to deflect an asteroid. Is there any examples of a company that is actively trying to pursue this idea? S not that particular idea, not to my knowledge. Okay. No. But there Thank are people who, people, there are people who look into these things. Thank you. I was just asking, what's the difference between the water on Earth and the water that's in the space? Ah. So there's zero difference between them. They're exactly the same. Water on Earth is made up of uh, two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. And water in asteroids is made of two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. And they go together and they're exactly identical. The, the difference is that if you went to a nice, if, uh, maybe if you were in Minnesota or Canada where I'm from and you go to a nice clean lake, you could probably drink the water out of the lake and it would, you probably would not hurt you. But if you drank the water that came directly out of the asteroid, it would not be good because there's lots of other metals and, and organic compounds in the asteroid that have, you have to purify the water from the asteroid before you can actually drink it. But once it's purified, once you remove everything that's not water, then you just got water exactly like on Earth. So you're trying to get the stuff, <clears throat> sorry, that's in the water to help your spaceships go up instead of the water itself? No, we're, we're trying to get the water. We're trying to get the water itself because from, from the asteroid, so we wanna, we, 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 we get the, we extract the water from the asteroid. But when we first extract the water from the asteroid, it's got a lot of impurities in it. It's got a lot of contaminants. And we wanna remove all the impurities, the contaminants, and just leave the pure water. And then once we have the pure water, then we can drink it, or we can use it to fuel a spacecraft, or we can use it to grow plants. But then why don't you just use the water from Earth? Oh, because, uh, because when you, when you try and get water from the Earth into space, you have to launch it. And you, that requires a, a rocket ship. And a rocket ship requires, you've seen, you've probably seen a rocket launch. And there's all, those are massive rockets and they expend a lot of energy. And so you've got to, to, to launch one liter of water, one quart of water into space requires a tremendous amount of fuel. So if you can get the one liter of water, one quart of water up in space already, you don't have to worry about using all that fuel to get it up there. 
Okay. How do you envision this mining operation uh, to actually be accomplished? Is this going to be a completely, a completely robotic sort of thing, or are you going to have a crew of human beings? And if so, they're going to be exposed to the radiation space for long periods of time, getting the things in this donut of, of low delta V. Uh, how are you going to protect the crew if you have to have a crew? So certainly in the beginning, we plan on robotic spacecraft. But as time progresses, I imagine that humans will be in space and you can send humans along and it could be maybe more efficient and you, they could deal with issues uh, rapidly and, and, and solve problems. That the, uh, of course, I didn't have a lot of time to go into everything in my talk, but our, our actual current vision is that I, show, I showed those three spacecraft that were in the orbits around the sun, but they looked like they were going around the Earth. Well. So if an asteroid's coming through the Earth-Moon system, those three spacecraft would see it, but by the time you've done all the measurements on it, it's already gone through the system, so that's not very useful. But just those three spacecraft are going around the Earth. The Earth doesn't have to be there. You could move those three spacecraft over here. You can move the three spacecraft over here. And so they're going over like this. They're going around uh, another location in space, ahead of Earth in its orbit and behind Earth in its orbit, so that you can catch for the asteroids before they actually enter the Earth-Moon system. So you basically go out to them, you start mining them, you're mining them, you know, maximum operations as they're passing through the Earth-Moon system, and then by the time they're just beyond, then you come back to the Earth-Moon system, right? So you don't have to go very far from Earth to do these things. So also you've got the water itself to act as radiation shielding, and you've got the material from the asteroid. You know, the, the leftover material, right now I'm, I haven't talked about it, but the uh, leftover material from the asteroid, we could bring that back as well, and that leftover material could be used to sh for shielding for the spacecraft that the astronauts are in or for growing things back on space station. So there's lots of opportunities to solve all these problems. And if I may, a second question, the uh, donut, you know, if something is on the far side of the solar system from the Earth's orbit, how long does it take it to come around? What fraction of the stuff in the donut is available at any time? So we, 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 we've, we're simulating exactly that, and the, the, the discovery rate for these objects is not zero, <laughs> but it's also not hundreds. Uh, but we think it's at the level where you know, if you have a, 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 real, a, a realistic system that we think can actually be built, we think you could, we could detect enough asteroids something on the order of one or two asteroids per month that we could actually mine. And so you don't have to think about having, say, one spacecraft. And you know, oh, we're also not talking about operating the way that you know, NASA normally does, where they, they have a spacecraft, they, they see it, they've got an asteroid they want to go to, and so they build a spacecraft 10 years in advance, and then they launch, and it takes 10 years to get there. Uh, you know, that, that's not the model we're talking about. We're talking about a model where the spacecraft are already in high Earth orbit. So there's 10 mining spacecraft that are in high Earth orbit, and they're just waiting for one of these asteroids that we've discovered to come through the system. And once we find it, we send one of those spacecraft to that asteroid to mine it. Once we find the next asteroid, you know, another spacecraft goes to mine it. So there's this constant process happening of uh, constant mining of asteroids that are coming through the system. And so this is our last question. Okay. So who are the investors now, and will it be net profitable from the first asteroid you capture? So currently, the, uh, I, I, I'm not, let's put it this way, I'm not really privy to the financial <laughs> information for TransAstra, but I, I know that they've been getting a, a lot of funding from uh, the Space Force and from NASA, particularly from a, a great program at NASA that p few people hear about called the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts. And uh, the NIAC program does, does all the, amazing things and the, it's, the, it's the sort of like forward thinking coming up with the crazy ideas that eventually become real ideas. And so that's how they got a lot of the funding to support the research that went into what we're currently doing. All right, let's thank Dr.